I'd like to show you a game played between Judit Polgar and Gary Kasparov in 2002 in the Russia against the world match played in Moscow. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting us via Patreon or PayPal. Now, there is a bit of a story behind this game because Judith had lost her first two games, but she was told by the captain of the team, Yasser Sirawan, that she would only be playing one game on the next day. And that game would be against Kasparov. So that meant that she went into this game fully rested and having prepared a little bit as well, whereas Kasparov was playing every single game. So this was his third game of the day. Now, it was a rapid play event, 25 minutes per player plus 10 seconds increment per move. Nevertheless, to play three rapid play games is pretty exhausting. Now, there's a big difference in rating. You can see Yudit at this time was rated 26.81. Kasparov rated 28.38. So what would happen? The rested Polgar against, well, the ever-bristling Kasparov. Kasparov with the black pieces. Now, he's not playing his normal Sicilian. Maybe he wanted to just, you know, play a calmer game against uh, Polgar, who, of course, is renowned for her expertise in tactical positions. Instead, he's allowed a Spanish and he played knight f6, the Berlin variation. Now remember, just two years before this, he had played his world championship match against Kramnik and Kramnik had used the Berlin variation to great effect, neutralizing Kasparov's white pieces basically during the match. So it's interesting to see Kasparov taking on this variation and using it himself and probably he just thought yeah i want to play something much calmer against judith that must be the way to tackle her style and judith goes for the end game there are other ways to play against the berlin but she goes for the end game and this was the variation that was really tested in that kramnik kasparov match of course, there are many different ways that black can actually play this position. Move order is so flexible for both sides, actually. So this position is pretty standard. And h3. So with this, it's possible that you is preparing to play g4 quite quickly to drive away the knight. Maybe, you know, getting this kingside pawn majority in action get it get it rolling here knight e7 has become the most popular move for black uh, or at least the most popular among the top players in the world but many different moves have been tried here bishop d7 um, and kasparov played bishop e7 here but it's interesting that knight e7 you know and it has been played an incredibly uh, slow move but it means that it preempts g4, which could possibly be met by h5 then. It's a very flexible move. Anyway, bishop e7 played by Kasparov. And knight e2 from Polgar. So this manoeuvre is very well known in this whole variation. The knight very often comes to f4 looking at e6, also looking at the h5 square, and sometimes comes into d4 as well. Now, black has lots of moves here. We've had a5 played, mysterious move. Uh, we've had bishop d7 played. Um, b6 has, is the most popular move. Bishop d7 was played in a game in 1896 with Alaska playing the white side of this. Incredible, you know, there's so much... Uh, it, so much theory so many games played in these lines and actually the berlin is a variation that was kind of rediscovered after decades and decades you know after 
basically a hundred years. You know, in the 1890s it was played. So, knight h4 from Kasparov. Well, exchanging off this piece, how wise is that? Looks like it kind of clears the air a little bit, because he's worried about that knight being driven away. But black has lost quite a bit of time in exchanging that knight off. Bishop b3 I like a lot. Just pointing down to the pawn on a7. So black has to think of a way of, you know, at some point he's going to have to move the rook. So what does he do about that pawn? Well, you know, b6 looks like an obvious move. But, for example, we could play a4 to go for a5. And if here... Then knight d4 attacks that pawn, and of course if it advances, then the knight finds a beautiful square on b5. So it's not so obvious how black should play after bishop b3. And in the meantime, well, white has plenty of things to do here. Simply doubling on the d-file could present problems. Uh, black cannot castle, remember, the king has already moved back and forth. And that means that white's rooks are combining perfectly. But black has split rooks. There you go. I've said it for the first time. But it's not going to be the last time you're going to hear a split rooks in this game. So bishop f5. Knight d4. So Kas Kasparov keen to bring his bishop out because he wants to get this rook into play. And here he plays the bishop back to h7 seems that probably bishop g6 is is a more prudent move because it might be that it's important to cover the f7 square anyway he went back to h7 bishop d7 is also possible actually but bishop h7 and now well you might like to have a think how do you play here with white how many of us would casually flick in g3 and drive the bishop back and then you know, press forward. But actually that would be a mistake because the bishop wants to be back here anyway. Polgar played g4. That's an excellent move. We don't need to push the, the bishop back because basically black wants to be able to counter g4 by playing h5. But of course, h5, well, here would allow g5 and that bishop is looking pretty hopelessly placed on h4. Watch out for, for example, knight f3. So in other words, if black is going to get in h5, this bishop needs to retreat first. So Kasparov played bishop e7. So you can see that basically, you know, g4 gets the majority going, gets this king side majority rolling, and he hasn't had to waste the tempo playing g3. Now, if you push pawns like this on the king side, the best thing to do is to follow up with the king because at some moment those pawns are going to need protection. So king g2, nice and prudent, and the f-pawn is still here so if there's a check you can still play uh, f3 or indeed go to g3. h5, so Kasparov is hoping to find some counterplay down the h-file. But knight f5 is an excellent move. Looking at the bishop, looking at the pawn on g7, and if that's taken, then you've got that wonderful pawn to you, and, and, and black's position is really looking pretty dismal there. Particularly as, yes, those rooks are split, they don't combine, that means there's no counterplay. It's tough, and actually the king is very poorly placed in the middle. So after knight f5, Kasparov dropped the bishop back to f8. Just, well, now there's two pieces in the way of those rooks. Polgar played king f3, just bringing the king up. That's nice. I mean, there's, in this position, there's, there's no need to rush things. I think the important thing is just to improve your position step by step. Because black doesn't really have a very good plan here. You know, if that knight is driven away by g6, well, the knight just drops back here. The bishop will be miserable. 
the knight can spin around here. Well, it's look at these weak squares. It's dreadful. So Kasparov played bishop g6. You can see how it would have been better to play the bishop there in the first place. And now rook d2. So it could be that the rook swings along the first rank, maybe to g1. More likely to d1, but this looks very nice with those beautiful rooks combining together. Pawn takes pawn check. Pawn recaptures. Rook h3 check. Is that painful? No, nope. the king just nudges the rook backwards and then comes up very calmly to g3, just covering those squares. Well, really what black would like to do here is exchange off one of those rooks to neutralize this the, the, the threats, really, of this. So what about rook d8? Well, before we look at the game continuation, let's just have a quick look at this. So this was not played, but let's see why not. Well, we can exchange. Rook number two comes over, and then bishop g5, threatening a mate on d8. So you can see this is just so difficult. Basically, black will have to give up a pawn to prevent this mate, and that's pretty hopeless. And this is kind of a slow motion threat to double the rooks and play bishop g5. And there's not a lot that black can do about that. I mean, it's once the bishop gets there. So Kasparov decided to preempt all that and play f6. But opening up the position when the king's in the middle is perilous, to put it mildly. But of course, Kasparov knew that. I mean, I think he was hoping that Polgar might have played e6. But that would give him a slim chance with something like this. And then king e7. Well, you can see that Well, with rook number two perhaps coming over here, maybe g6 on the cards, black has a chance there. Yup. Once the rooks combine, then that's a different story. So Polgar resisted that temptation and played bishop f4. Good move. I think that just maintains all white's advantages in the position. Bishop takes f5, pawn takes f5, and pawn takes e5. And now rook e1. So the king could be in huge trouble. Bishop d6, bishop takes e5. So once again, Kasparov is really pinning his hopes on a rook end game. Perhaps he can ditch a pawn and get some drawing chances here. And of course, in playing like this, it means he can connect those rooks. But white's initiative is very powerful. So the threat is to win a piece. Therefore, c5. But now it's possible to exchange and play rook e6 because... Now this pawn is advanced, well there's no d5 basically, and this pawn on d6 is going to drop. And white's initiative continues. So finally black has managed to connect the rooks, but the position is hopeless. Another excellent move from Udit. She's attacking that pawn, and basically once b6 comes then the rook will be able to slide in there. So anyway, first Kasparov dishes out a few checks, but the king is safe. It staggered up the board. If the rook checks here, then white can simply interpose. So finally Kasparov plays b6 to protect the pawn, but now the rook slides in. Check. King here. And rook d7, conquering the 7th rank. I don't think it, it wouldn't have made any difference if the king had gone to b7. Uh, this one would have uh, been dropping. Let me just show that very quickly. So if king here, attacking the rook, then rook 
rook g6 or rook e6, followed by rook check. I, I prefer rook g6, actually. Basically, this is a winning position for white. So king b8 played, rook d7 attacking the pawn, and, well, conquering that seventh rank. It looks really painful. And Kasparov is just going through the motions here. There, there really is nothing to do. If the rook checks, well, we can just play f3. It's very dangerous to have the rook off the back rank when black's king is stuck there. Rook f8, rook c7, rook takes, rook b7 check. Always a lot of fun to have double rooks on the seventh rank. We've got two threats there. King going back to c8, but actually Kasparov resigned here. It is completely hopeless. For example, rook takes is a second pawn and a second threat of mate. And now actually the simplest way to win is just to exchange rooks. Black has to exchange because of the threats of mate coming soon. And then, well, white is two pawns up and a combination of the threat of playing the rook, playing, excuse me, playing the king into c6 and advancing the f-pawn. It is absolutely hopeless. Kasparov didn't want to suffer in that endgame. I think this game shows that Polgar is a multifaceted player. Of course, she has a wonderful uh, tactical imagination, incredibly creative ideas, loves attacking. But like any of the top players in the world, she can play all kinds of positions. And here we saw a wonderful display, well, a positional display. And yeah, it shows her, her prowess in the endgame as well. So there we go. Hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching.